Welcome to the Studio African Utility Week. I'm Rose Bundock and I'm joined now by Michael Liebrick, Chairman of the Advisory Board and founder of Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Welcome. Hi there. I wanted to ask you some quite macro um, questions about Africa and the potential that you see. Um, it's been said that Africa has the potential and resources to become a world economic powerhouse. So what is standing in its way at the moment? Well, it's a, it's a strange time to be asking questions about Africa becoming the world uh, economic powerhouse just because, you know, this is a, the, the commodity price crash, the oil price crash is obviously stressing a lot of African uh, economies. You know, a few years ago, um, it was probably, we were, people were probably being over optimistic, you know, Africa at the time had seven of the ten uh, fastest growing economies in the world, according to uh, The Economist. And again, that was probably to do with, um, you know, uh, commodity prices being uh, you know, be, being over-egged, as it were. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, I'm enormously optimistic long-term about the growth of Africa, of its economy, uh, and, and, and so on. But it's, it's going to be neither it's going to be neither the sort of uh, you know the the, the, the over egg the over optimistic vision from three years ago, nor is it going to be some of the doom and gloom that you hear uh, because of the commodity price crash over the last you know, eighteen months. So where are we going to see opportunity against these tough conditions? So, uh, I think that the commodity prices will sort of sort themselves out. They always do, ultimately, and uh, there'll be pain along the way. But fundamentally, I do believe that you know Africa is going to outgrow the rest of the world economy. Um, I think that's that's just you know based on uh, the you know, progress it's made over the last decade, based on the opportunities, and you start to see uh, you know China uh, growth is slowing. The government still says it's seven percent growth. Personally, I'm sort of doubtful of that. You see growth picking up perhaps in, you know, in India now, uh, not what the Modi government wants to see, but it, it seems healthy enough. Uh, you know, and, and I think also that you know, Africa will, in some perverse ways, it will benefit from the fact that the Middle East is very unstable. So people looking for opportunities, Africa actually much of it looks much more stable than some of the other parts of the world. Um, and so I think that, that, that generates opportunities for adventurous investors. Don't, don't forget that it's very difficult to find good investment opportunities now in the developed world. Um, Europe is, you know, is really finding it. You know, it has had Italy has had zero growth for I think it's 19 years now. Um, you know, Europe is growing at whatever it is overall, uh, half a percent, one percent if they're lucky, touching on zero percent. So where do you go if you want uh, if you want either exciting growth or slightly higher yields than you can get from sovereign debt in the developed world. And um, you know, there's a proportion of that that can be found in Africa, even even in the kind of difficult times. Yeah. Which countries in particular are kind of standing out or on your investment radar? So, uh, um, it's funny, I didn't think this would be like, I've been hearing a lot about Botswana. A uh, number of people that I met in the last uh, day and a half that I've been here have been uh, talking about Botswana. South Africa is also, I mean, it's just, you know, it is, for all its, for all its, um, uh, you know, it has a very sort of, very active media, which can sometimes, um, of which you're part in this case, but, you know, it can sometimes really seem as though, you know, it lurches from this kind of fantastic success story to this sort of, you know, basket case to a success story. To a, the fact is, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's Africa's biggest or second biggest, but, it's a diversified, fairly advanced economy, lots of structural issues still to deal with, but it's a good economy. It's an economy you can do business in. So I'm, I'm bullish, you know, I'm, I'm bullish uh, South Africa. Morocco, uh, in terms of clean energy, is incredibly ambitious um, projects, but also not just ambition. We're seeing the, the Wazazat solar project that's been delivered. You've got the wind uh, projects at very low cost, sort of three cent wind, four and a half cent solar. Uh, goals of 42% by 2020, whatever it is, 52% renewable energy by 20, uh, 2030, I think that one is, um, going to host the, the next COP negotiation. So a very self-confident performance yeah. uh, by Morocco. Uh, and you know, where Morocco goes, that we, we see um, you know, the, the, the rest of the sort of North African countries, uh, Tunisia won't want to be there far behind, Egypt, there are projects, a little bit more help from the international community there. Uh, up into the Arab world, Jordan, we see projects, Ethiopia projects, Kenya, Tanzania. You know, so I, I suppose you know, m many countries doing interesting things. Zambia, I've been hearing about the last few days. Um, you know, people trying to kind of un, uh, trying to figure out Zambia for you know, overseas investors. Yeah. Is that something for you know? The, is that going to be an opportunity? So, I, I think it's it's probably not 
it's probably you need to look at the individual opportunity and not so much the country as it were because that that you know there's a lot of there's a lot of um, de-risking at the, at the project and the opportunity level. It's yeah. not possible just to say, here's a good country, here's a bad country, not yeah. at all. Nigeria, we haven't um, touched on that. What's your opinion? Yeah, I mean, Nigeria, um, before the oil price crash, before the, you know, the sort of first half of 2014, it really looked very, very promising because obviously the money was flowing in from the oil and it was you know, starting to address some of the governance issues that have always plagued Nigeria since I've been uh, you know, uh, uh, in business. Um, and it seemed like some real momentum around uh, putting a stop to flaring. I mean, flaring in Nigeria, Kande Yamkela, uh, the, uh, the, the founding head of Sustainable Energy for All, who's now uh, uh, he's still you know, very active in energy, although he's uh, working on his own political uh, aspirations, but he was here today, and he was saying how it is unacceptable, he used this word very forcefully, unacceptable, and it is unacceptable to have such an abundance of natural resources, particularly in Nigeria, and just to be flaring it. You know, there's no version of the future where natural gas is not going to be used in some way, shape or form. You can't just allow it to be flared and then also have very large proportion of the majority of your population not connected to the electricity grid uh, and still, you know, cooking with, uh, with traditional biofuels. I mean, unacceptable is really the word for it, I'm afraid. You were also I, sorry, I have to be careful when I say that because you know I come from London and it's, I don't yeah. want to I don't want to fly around Africa yeah. saying what's acceptable and unacceptable. <laughs> I'm quoting there yes. Mr. Yum Keller, who does have the right to yeah. say that. Let me be very I want to be very clear though. I'll get you get me in trouble. You were also part of that keynote um, opening yeah. address. What was your message for the audience? Well, I actually harked back to the last time I spoke uh, at an event in South Africa, which is now amazingly five years ago. To my shame, I've not been back in between. Um, and, uh, but I pulled out my old uh, script, my old, the transcript of what I said, and I stood up five years ago in Johannesburg at an energy ministerial, and I said, you know, we've, we, there were a few things that we needed to, a few misconceptions. Um, you know, one was that you either did clean energy or you worked on development. No, the, the, you do energy and development is the same issue, that was one. But the other thing, I stood up five years ago and I said, Renewable energy is not expensive. It's not just something for rich developed world countries because wind is six cents per kilowatt hour, which is the same price as gas, as electricity from gas. And solar, people say it's expensive. Nonsense, it's 17 US cents per kilowatt hour. Well, now the world record project are three cents per kilowatt hour for wind. And that's in Morocco, that's an African project. Yeah. And three cents per kilowatt hour in Dubai for solar, not 17, not even half of 17, but three cents. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was sort of reinforcing that this extraordinary cost drop of renewable energy has powered on, and you know what, it's gonna keep going. It's gonna keep going. That's fantastic. So just going back to South Africa, I mean, do, do you still, uh, you know, last year's um, theme, I think, was Africa is open for business. You know, do, do people still see South Africa as the gateway in your sort um, of experience of conversation? I think they, I think they do, and I'm judging now. You know, because I sort of follow the news out of Africa reasonably as closely as I as I can, given that I, I don't travel here as often as I should, as I've already said. Um, but you know, there was this whole thing, sort of, um, that Nigeria's uh, GDP was reevaluated, and it suddenly jumped by this enormous figure, and it was Nigeria is top economy in uh, yeah. in South Africa, and. You know, I suspect that a lot of that was technical adjustments and probably very distorted also by uh, their, their economy size, distorted by the amount of, uh, of oil, uh, of, of, uh, of petroleum industry there. So I still see South Africa as being the largest economy in South Africa. Do you know what? I think that competition between two major economies or between also East Africa, West Africa, between Southern Africa and between North Africa and so on. I think, I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a free markets guy, so, I, you know, minimum amount of regulation but for, I like competition competition I think in many cases brings out the best in us so if there's competition between different bits of Africa to um, you know uh, friendly competition and cooperation for yeah. regional power markets for gas pipelines for uh, for uh, you know to, for um, sharing or, or selling electricity cross-border of course as well but competition focuses the mind and it accelerates projects uh, it, it helps politicians to kind of see you know, what other countries are doing that, that works well. Um, 
we do this thing called Climate Scope, which I also mentioned in my keynote, and um, it's a diagnostic for the, the investment attractiveness for clean energy of different countries. And it's really designed as a diagnostic. What are you doing well? What could you, where could you improve? What would make a country more attractive for clean energy? By the way, African countries do really well. There's three of the top 10 countries in the developing world that we've assessed. Out of, out of Asia, Latin America, and Africa, three of the top 10 are African. Um, and and uh, from memory, that's, Ke that's uh, South Africa, Kenya, Uganda. Um, but there are plenty of others in the top 20. And you, know, you could say, well, it's all about competition. You know, South Africa did better than... Well, it, it kind of is, but it's also just a diagnostic. Yeah. Um, but co competition does focus everybody's minds, what can I say? I was a competitive athlete. <laughs> What's driven that success in Africa then? The success of um, solar, of wind? Of kind of... Well, I think um, two things stand out. Number one is that uh, the experience curve, this idea that clean energy technologies get cheaper the more of them you build. So every time you double your installed base, the costs go down by a fairly predictable amount. And so that's what's driven solar from 17 cents five years ago to three, well, probably the median projects now, you could easily build solar, I'm sure, in many countries of Africa for you know, four, five, six cents, seven cents. There's, there's no question. The other thing, though, is that's enabled that is the move to reverse auctions. So bringing price discovery back into the process, really um, forcing the providers to compete on price. Because previously, it was closed tenders. So somebody would offer to, 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 to furnish a project and the price would be agreed behind closed doors. And lo and behold, surprise, surprise, it was much higher than it probably needed to be. Yeah. Don't ask where all of that money went. That's another issue that, that has to be you know, ha has to be out there and, and uh, discussed. The, the question of where, you know, where and who is, is benefiting from each of these projects. Um, so the closed tender process was inefficient. The feed-in tariff process, where energy ministries do lots of analysis, lots of work, and then say, mm, this is the price that we're going to give everybody who bids, is also very inefficient. And I, I was making that point loud and clear for, frankly, quite a few years. Um, against the, the fans of the feed-in tariff. Uh, feed-in tariff is just a state price, and we know it's inefficient. We know it, you know, what it did to the Soviet Union. We know what happens when bureaucrats set prices. They tend to get them either too low, and then you can't buy the thing, whether it's, whether it's toilet paper in Venezuela or, or electricity, clean electricity. Uh, and if they set it too high, then there's a big bubble, and everybody turns up, rocks up from all over the world, sells too much, it becomes a problem to integrate the electricity into the grid, and then when the government reacts and changes the price, those birds fly off again, having stripped the, the fields bare. So the reverse auctions deal with those problems. You get the right price, price discovery we call it, and then as long as the, the uh, auction is, is uh, structured correctly, as the ones in South Africa have yeah. been, um, the projects get built, the electricity gets, dis gets delivered, and the developer gets paid only when the electricity is delivered because the, the auction is for a price for electricity. It's not a price to build it and walk away whether it works or not. It's a price for electricity, but guaranteed for some period, some period of years. And that has meant that these very cheap solar prices and wind prices are actually being delivered to consumers. And, you know, what's really important is um, in some cases, in many cases now, that's cheaper than the wholesale prices. You know, if you look at it, okay, Jordan, I don't know, it's, it's sort of Middle East more than, more than specifically Africa, but their, their wholesale electricity price is double what the wind projects uh, can deliver electricity for. I mean, this is just fantastic. It's a win-win-win all round. It's a win for the environment, it's a win for the consumer, it's a win for the developer who gets good business. It's, it's a, you know, this is good business. And we're seeing that in you know, the projects in Morocco, it's good business. Um, you know, South Africa, there's a bit, a bit of a kind of a wobble because, um, you know, the, uh, the, the projections of demand for energy, you know, there was only a couple of years ago, there was the big furore about load shedding, load shedding, how unacceptable. Here we are uh, controlling our destiny, building our economy, building, uh, integrating all of these, uh, you know, all of these uh, regions of the country that have not had power. And, and how dare we have load shedding? And so there was this enormous plan, Madupi and uh, uh, the Kisele, the other, and of course now they're probably not actually going to be uh, needed. 
uh, or not not the full amount. Yeah, I mean, I um, suppose... So that's a bit of a wobble, to be honest, yeah. yeah. Um, does South Africa still need to prove itself? Well, you know, for the procurement plan, obviously, the programme went very well in terms of opening up the market. The, the re- you mean the renewables? Yes, yeah, the renewables. Yeah. But some of those no, projects are still... South Africa doesn't have to prove still itself. Still to come online, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. But, there, but I think there's a high degree of confidence that they will. Um, the other thing that happens as you get more, um, as, you, as you start to get more penetration of renewable electricity into the grid, so you have to also invest in skills to manage that because of course the wind blows when it wants to blow, you can predict it, you can forecast it, but it's not always there. And the sun obviously is only during the day and then if you have a, you know, if you've got weather changes quite rapidly then it, you know, it can be a, bit, a little bit unpredictable. You have to invest in weather forecasting. You have to invest in the ability to provide backup. Um, these things sound very difficult. Some people will tell you they're terribly difficult and renewable energy is impossible and we'll have blackouts. So I don't know, 12 years I've been doing this, I don't know of a single blackout anywhere in the world caused by the intermittency of renewable energy. I actually don't know of a single case. Even um, when there was an eclipse in Northern Europe recently, yeah. which cut the solar in Italy and Germany and then suddenly it came back and it was managed without really very without really the uh, the the uh, grid operator breaking a sweat quite extraordinary but you have to invest in that but that, yeah. that that's that's doable those are challenges you can meet and meanwhile you know when the penetration of solar into the grid is you know half a percent one percent two percent three percent but it really is not it's a it's sort of non-issue yeah. thank you Michael yeah. that's all we've got time for very good Thanks pleasure for joining us